Hello and welcome to the second look on the Anfield Raps YouTube channel after Liverpool nil, Bayern Munich nil at Anfield. I am Dan Austin and I'm joined by Stu Wright and Mo Stewart to talk about the round of 16 Champions League first leg. And Mo, I think a goalless draw is probably the last thing anyone really expected. It was definitely the last thing anyone expected. I've been keen to see what the odds have been at the start of the game because I think the one thing everyone was saying was what we can guarantee is goals because Bayern's defence had looked shaky in recent weeks. Our defence was makeshift and there was two great attacks there. So logic would tell you there's going to be some goals. But Bayern were a little bit more circumspect than maybe we were expecting. But maybe we should have expected it more when you consider the reputation that we have in European games based on last season. And the way that when Man City came to Liverpool to go into Anfield during the season, Pep Guardiola did the same thing and it worked in the same way, which is the only other time we've drawn 0-0 this season. So maybe looking at it with a bit of perspective, we should have been expecting it more, but it'll be interesting to see how both teams feel at the end of the game because both of them will feel like they've got something to go on. But who's going to be the more positive? I don't know. Stu, it's strange that I think if you, if you draw 0-0 in the Champions League a decade ago, you view it as a sort of different result in a way, and you would presume that it's a cagey match, two tactically astute teams trying to feel each other out, not take too many risks and stuff. It didn't feel like that to me actually watching it though. It felt like two very, very good football teams playing fairly intense stuff. There was a lot of pressing, a lot of interceptions fairly high up the pitch from both sides. But just then in the final for the third, neither of them really had the quality to make it count. Yeah. Um... I thought it was a bit of a bit of a cat and mouse game, to be honest. I think Bayern set the stall out uh, fairly early on, and you know they were looking to try and keep the ball as much as they can, but but not overcommit. I mean, you didn't see uh, Kimmich making his usual runs, um, you know, down the wing as, as, as he was far more disciplined, uh, holding his holding his uh, shape there with the back four. Um, I think I think that was quite telling. I also think the fact that. They took no risks through the centre of midfield at all. We were we were talking before the show about how um, there was a lot of Pep Guardiola in that game, really, and that's not just because I'm uh, I've got the spectre of Man City uh, constantly on my mind, but there, there was really. I mean, it was interesting. There was there was quotes that came out before Bayern Munich appointed Pep um, from their, from their top brass about how they were looking for a legacy from him. They were looking for a man who would come in and change the culture of the club and, and that when he left, there would, you know, there would still be this residual pattern of play. And there was elements of that, I think, clear last night. The way, the way they got out from the back time and time again and beat our press was, was, was fantastic, really. Um, very, very impressive. But I also think that, as you hinted at there, Mo, the, the, it's, it's no surprise that Nikol Kovac has probably looked at Man City's tactics against us both home and away this season. Because if you if you like, I mean that's the kind of results that they want. You know, a draw at Anfield and a, and a win at their own ground that Man City have got this season. And um, I think tactically their setup was very similar, considering that the quality they've got through the central areas with Javi Martinez, who I thought was really good by the way, um, Alcantara and Rodriguez. They didn't seem to want to take any risk. They didn't really seem to want to carry the ball through much to the centre of midfield. They didn't want to have any runners from there. Um, and everything was confined. All the risks that they were taking were confined to the wide areas, uh, which was very, very much mirroring uh, Guardiola's approach this season to play in Liverpool. So, uh, you know, I, I think that was really interesting. I'd be really, really surprised, though, if they sh show such discipline again in the away leg. Mm -hmm. Mo, I want to talk about Naby Keita for a minute specifically because I thought he was, in a sense, the most interesting player mm -hmm. for Liverpool. Uh, especially first half, I thought that he was very bright. I thought that he was the one member of that midfield show that was getting Liverpool forward. He was carrying the ball forward, he had his head up, he had a bit of um, purpose and he, it felt like he was playing on the front foot for a lot of it. And then, he faded second half, but just generally throughout the game anyway. His final action, his final decision was never quite there. And we're at this point with him where he's, he's demonstrably an incredibly talented footballer. And Klopp has spoken about him being one of the first names on the team sheet. And it feels like he needs to play some games to get that bit of rhythm in him. But it feels like he just needs one of those through balls, one of those shots. He just needs one of those final actions to really go for him and then he'll kick on. Yeah. It's almost like his performance was a microcosm of our whole attacking performance in as much as there was lots to be encouraged about, but we never quite actually nailed it. And I was hoping the ball he played through to 
for Salah's goal in Bournemouth. Obviously, it wasn't the actual assist, it was the ball to Firmino. I'm hoping that that would be the catalyst that starts him. And you are beginning to see him be a bit more confident. I was actually more impressed with him in the defensive capacity last night. He was a lot more sure of where he needed to be to win the ball back and carry it forward quickly. But you're right, there's still just that one little thing missing the ball. Sometimes you just need the ball to run for you. In a similar way to we were talking about Solanke last year where he was doing lots of good things and it just never got to him. I'm hoping that it does happen for Naby. I mean, Old Trafford would be a fantastic place for it to happen, mm-hmm. wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? But you're yeah, right, it was just just not miss it, just missing that last element. And if we'd have won that game 1-0, everyone would have been saying it was a good professional European performance and that just one little bit that we were missing. Stu, you mentioned um, the quality that you thought was in the Bayern midfield during the game. Um, we've spoken about Kaita. I think it was quite clear that Jordan Henderson was the best player on the pitch. Oh, yeah. Um, I think the fact that... I mean, that's helped by the fact that he's not, in theory, your match winner. So if Sadio Mane scores a couple of the chances, Sadio Mane is automatically your man of the match. But because of the way that Henderson... I don't want to say the word bossed because it just feels like a cliche, but he was, very, he was in control of that midfield more than anyone else on the pitch against an incredible standard of opposition with two players either side of him who have been a lot more talked about certainly in recent weeks anyway. I thought he put in the kind of performance that was reminiscent of the Napoli tie that got us to this stage where he just took the game by the scruff of the neck a lot and and gave us a lot of urgency, gave us that sense of control in the midfield that meant that although the game was relatively even and chances were scarce, it felt like every time that ball was picked up in the middle, Liverpool could go forward and do something. Yeah, I think there's a... We're seeing now Henderson in his prime. You know, we, we look at his age and the experience that he's got, actually. I mean, half the time I forget, I still, when, when I think of Jordan Henderson, Henderson, I still think of the lad, you know, that we first signed with the, you know, the very boyish young looks and what have you. But, but now he's, he's a player who's, who's taken a team, you know, as captain through to a Europa League final, a Champions League final. He's captained his country. Um, you know, been played, in a World Cup semi-final. Been in a World Cup semi-final. You know, there's, there's there's so much experience there, and you know, on nights like that, he gets a, you know he has a lot of detractors, Henderson, unfairly I would say. Um, but on nights like that, it, it really is a performance where you see him roll his sleeves up and say. I know what needs to be done here, and I know how to get the best out of the players around me. I know how to to not just worry about my own game, but also their game as well. Um, and it, yeah, it was a very, very commanding performance. And as you say, Dan, it's not the first time that we've seen him come out of a performance like that on a, on a big European night. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't ignore the centre halves. It was the main concern going into the game. Uh, they're playing against Robert Lewandowski, who's the Champions League top scorer, one of the most potent forwards in world football. Um, th- you know, there are reasons why Lewandowski doesn't get into the game so much anyway, but I thought both of them dealt by and large very well. Fabinho, especially Mo, I thought just looked so competent <coughs> in that role for someone who, although he's played as his defender, he's played as a right full back, yeah. not a centre back. And he goes in there and you miss things from him because he's not playing midfield anymore. But he just looks so assured and calm. And, and for a player that doesn't do that on a regular basis, I think it's fantastic. I think that goes speaks to his nature. I think he's naturally that kind of person. Again, I think that was one of the things Klopp looked for in him when we brought him in. But what has uh, surprised and actually impressed me about his centre-back play is the positioning. Because that's the thing that you expect to come later if once you've got experience of knowing where you, you're supposed to be and how that's different to when you're playing right back or you're playing forward in the midfield. But he seemed to crack onto it really quickly. You're right, though, that Bayern's tactics did help in as much as they didn't have as much at one time to deal with. They were never kind of overloaded on one side with forks overlapping. In fact, from Alaba and Kimmich, I've never seen be uh, less attacking than that. Kimmich, it's kind of understandable because he did get the early yellow card, so that might have been in his mind. But when you look at the other side, you think, well, that's obviously got to be their tactic. But I think, again, this is another area that Henderson needs some credit because the organisation of everything, of everyone knowing where they need to be, that was down to him. Because we know that Matip's not the most cool when it comes to it. Uh, Fabinho, obviously, it was his one second game there, so we can't be expecting him to be organised everyone. But it was Henderson. And any time that there was a bit of sloppy play or there was a mistake, he was the one who was first there to sweep it up. So... It was a triumph for the training pitch, I think, but also a feather in the capitalist team that when someone as vital as Van Dijk has been, 
was taken out, they were still able to keep a clean sheet. Just, just a word on Matic. I'm not a Matic fan, to be quite honest with you. I'm very much a Paul Senior sympathiser with this, and he called it early and he called it right. Um, but I would say that last night, I thought defensively he was, he was very, very good. Um, but I really, really need him to stop with the wander into the opposition's half with the ball and giving it away, can he just jib it? Because he's a menace. He's you know, an you know what? You know menace. what? It really strikes me about whenever he does that. He does the run. He gets his head up. He passes the footy at a million miles an hour yeah, after yeah. he does that run. No matter what, it's like he thinks. It's like he thinks I might lose this footy. So if I lose it, I'm just going to make sure it gets blammed out of place so no one can get me on the break. It's such a strange passage of play that he does, and there must be someone at Melwood who thinks. I'm going to tell him to stop doing that because it doesn't ever really no. come off for you. It doesn't do anything positive. I, 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 don't, I don't understand you know, his, his thought process because, as you say, it's never come off that I can think of. <laughs> ever. And he's doing it time and time. It's almost as if at the moment he's thinking, this is my big shot for a run of games, so I need to show I've got you know, some extra yeah. stings to my bow. But this is actually, this is, you know, completely the opposite of what you should be doing because every time it's shown his deficiencies. Well, it's also, I think, a product of the fact that the opposition are more likely to give him space and time on the ball than any other player in our 11 yeah. for precisely that yeah. reason. And in his mind, he's thinking, well, if I can prove that I am a threat, then they're going to have to do it again. It kind of reminds me of when Dan Aga used to do that. He used to go on those obviously Dan was a lot more comfortable on the ball and the trick that he always did is he would always win a free kick yeah. even if he would get into trouble he'd find a way to win a free kick and then that way we would stay up at the end of the pitch or he'd blam it in the top corner from 30 yards oh. <laughs> now based on last night I have to think that the former is a lot more likely to come from Matip than the latter because when he was in those two shooting positions Oh, just the man you did not want it to fall. Oh my goodness! The, the second, the one in the second half. I, I don't even think his mum thought he was going to score. Genuinely, <laughs> it was one of those where anybody else, just just anybody else, and we would have been one 0 up. But considering you can see, he's always going to be that guy who doesn't give you full confidence. He's always a little bit erratic in nature. A similar way to Sacco was, but not quite as kind of you know over the top with it. But put him in the system, give him enough training, and the concentration was there last night. That didn't slip for one moment, it didn't allow them that one moment that Lewandowski was looking for. So he's hoping the, the other stuff will improve. Right, Neil Atkinson has been a uh, little fiddle with his little counters. Um, so we're going to go to him now, and he's going to tell you more about how Bayern Munich set up against Liverpool. Well, they're not going to fiddle with themselves, are they? What we've got here is a pretty decent approximation of the average positions from last night. A couple of little things of note to start with. One is how close together Bayern's centre midfielders were uh, throughout much of the game. They very, were, very much were a two-man wall to try to deal with Liverpool and make things difficult for them. Also, uh, Firmino deepest in terms of average position uh, out of the front three. Uh, Salah upright and Mane are left. You can read too much into average positions, but I do think there's a couple of other things that are interesting. Nabry averaged a higher position than Lewandowski in terms of when he was involved in the game. And Lewandowski not getting on top of Liverpool's centre-halves, not pinning them back, not picking one to play on, is a bit of a feature of the night's game. He was very much there to help his side get out. And I think that that tells you a little bit about Bayern's approach. But for me, the whole game really can be summed up by the fact that now the manager changes it. I think there's lots of room for managers to have done different things. He could have, for instance, looked at picking one of Wijnaldum Alderman and Keiter and sacrifice them for Shakiri. Instead, he does Keiter for Milner and keep th keeps things relatively similar uh, in the way in which Liverpool were operating. He could, for instance, have pulled Salah in, moved Firmino out, or even just pulled Salah in and maybe even there introduced, introduced Shakiri rather than Origi. He doesn't do that either. Uh, he keeps Origi uh, through the middle of the pitch. He keeps Salah on the right hand side. He keeps Mane on the left. He doesn't really shake that up in any significant way. And I think you can say the same thing about the Bayern manager. You know, I mentioned Lewandowski there but he could have gone two up but I think the stage where he might have thought about going two up and looking to really pressure Liverpool's weak centre weak centre half partnership or more accurately untested centre half partnership I think he's thinking by that sort of stage that Martinez is, is, is tiring in the middle of the park for him so it's difficult for him to make that sort of call and he's also decided he's happy with it 
who should be happy with it and who shouldn't is a fascinating little one really this I had a little read of some uh, German football blogs uh, in English I hasten to add and they were both praising Bayern's approach but pointing out that they didn't really manage to properly land a glove on Liverpool's weak uh, untested centre-half partnership this is Liverpool's fourth and fifth choice central defenders remember no Virgil van Dijk no Gomez no Lovren and I think that that shows the sacrifice that Bayern have made. They sacrificed everything in order to keep Liverpool at bay, in order to not concede the first goal in the tie. And I think this is something we're going to see more and more of our sides come to Anfield. They're going to look to find a way to not concede that first goal. That might seem like the most obvious thing in the world, but I don't think it's necessarily the idea of going 1-0 down, but it's what Liverpool and that ground does on those big occasions between one goal and two. We saw it against Paris Saint-Germain earlier this season. We saw it last season against Manchester City and against Roma that Liverpool, when they get the momentum up, they're very difficult to deal with. And so therefore, I think the entire strategy from the Bayern manager is just never let them get the momentum up. Look to try to stop them. As it is, Liverpool still had chances. They could have gone one up in the game. It could have become a different game of football. But we'll have to see now as we move forward to Munich. Right, thanks very much, Tanil, for that. Some really good counter-fiddling going on there. Loads of tactical insight. Um, Mo, to talk about Bayern for a little bit, I think the thing that struck me most about them, and especially towards the end of the game, was how they had no discernible interest in scoring an away goal at any stage. And again, that was slightly retro in a European sense, in that the power of the away goal is seen as a huge thing now in the first leg. Um, but they bring Frank Ribéry on. He has no attack and influence on the game really he holds the ball up very well for them but nothing beyond that and James Rodriguez and Robert Lewandowski felt like they were playing separate games to the other nine Bayern Munich players there was no one within 30 40, 40 yards of them when they were going forward no and that must have been particularly frustrating for James because this was his big chance to play just off the striker the position that he thinks he's best in that he's been dying to play all season and couldn't because Kovac has preferred Thomas Muller more often than not so it was almost like it was a poison chalice for him. But it was, it was surprising because they do have a quality attacking players. And like you're right, even in the situation where they were going to frustrate Liverpool, the away goal on top of that performance would have made it the perfect away performance. And when we were missing our best defender and getting to that point in the game where we're starting to think, well, maybe it's not going to work out for us and maybe confidence in our team is starting to drop a little bit. That would have been the perfect time for an uh, uh, experienced European side to go for the kill, but they didn't. Now, is that because they spent so long in that defensive mode they couldn't snap out of it? Or are they just that confident in their home form? And to be honest, our European away form, which let's face it, the season has not been good. Stu, um, I think it was interesting that their best player was one who, if they've got a fully fit squad, doesn't get a start and might not even be on the bench. So for me, it was Sage Gnabry. He was the one who, going forward, gave them an outlet, first and foremost. He was helping them to get up the pitch when Liverpool had been on the break previously. And he was just the one that looked most dangerous. He had a couple of decent efforts in the second half. He had that one from distance, which was really quite close. He had Alisson worried. And it seemed like you mentioned earlier about their midfield. Javier Martinez and Thiago Alcantara were so deep that they couldn't really have anything coming forward from the middle because they were basically playing on top of their own centre-halves. And that meant that it was pretty much left up to Kingsley Coleman and Gnabry on the other side. And, and Gnabry definitely, for me, was, was the only real player for them that was, that was giving me a proper worry. Yeah, and again, um, I feel like I'm um, banging the same drum here, but again, I think this, there's a lot of... Um of Pep Guardiola within that, in terms of, I thought Gnabry and uh, Coleman w both had chalk on the boots the entire game. They, they really, really were disciplined in, in, in stretching the play all the time and offering that outlet. And it predominantly came down Gnabry's side, you know, maybe not surprisingly when, when Coleman was, was injured uh, only a few days ago. So, um, yeah, he was a good outlet. And I think that by, by stretching the play and by by pinning our full backs like that as well it also you know put a little bit of doubt into their mind i think what will be interesting in the second leg though is there's a lot of talk that that robin may well be fit for that and Gnabry therefore it might be questionable whether he starts um i think there's there's going to be an awful lot of changes but that could potentially happen between now and that i mean certainly just within the, the the amount of games that both sides have got to play within that period of time anyway you know injuries can come in but also you've got i think Goretzka, 
I think Eretzka will come in at home. I was, um, I, I think that he was a big miss for them last night. Um, so I think he'll come in. I think, as I say, there's, there's a, every chance that Robin will come in. And then also we've got to think, who are they going to replace uh, Kimmich with? And is that going to be Afinha? Um, there's, there's, there's probably every, every shout there. So um, I think if, if in the home leg, or their home leg, they've got a start of, of the two wily old foxes of uh, Ribery and, and Robin, who know how to you know navigate through ties like this, um, and Goretzka comes in and adds that extra threat and weight in midfield. I think there'll be a very very different uh, proposition, but at the same time, I don't think that's necessarily um, too much of a worry for us because if they feel that they've got a stronger hand, they're more likely to I think believe in themselves and commit more, and therefore. You know, that's where you know, Mane, Salah and Firmino love to eat up the space in behind. Uh, we've already spoken, obviously, about Liverpool centre-halves, but another player who, you know, ostensibly might not be in Bayern's first choice 11, if everyone's fit, that I was very much impressed by, was Nicolas Sula yeah. at the back, who somehow manages to make Mats Hummels look quite slim and short by just being the widest man you've ever seen yes. in your life. Um, and I thought he defended really, really well throughout. He was very um, he was very sly in the way that he did things. It was a favour of time wasting from him, but both of them managed to kind of nullify the space around Firmino really well, I thought. It's hard to look at him and not think of just a massive grok, but he has got a lot more uh, intelligence to his game. Uh, I think he's probably actually been the most consistent of the three centre-halves this season in the Bundesliga. So I wasn't that surprised. I mean, Boateng had a problem so I wasn't that surprised that he played but the the defensive line both him and Hummels were able to put together it was helped by the fact as you said the centre midfielders came and gave them so much protection but again concentration in a game like that where you're playing against three fast attacking players one moment can be enough to make a mistake and concede the goal and they never looked like doing that they always looked like they knew where they had to be and what they needed to do when it comes to the second leg, again, I expect those two to be uh, in tandem. And I do also expect it to be Rafinha. Further forward, it's going to be interesting because you think of it one sense and they say, do they go out for the blitz early on, try to shock us? And then you want to see the pace and trickery of a Nabri and a Coman. But if they're trying to be a little bit more cautious, try to not give us counter-attack space, then having those two to bring on late in the game once we've tired from a lot of defending is also a, a kind of a, a teasing proposition, if you'll know, of Kovac. So it'll be interesting to see which one they go for and it will tell us how they're thinking about approaching the game. Right, that's about all we've got time for on the second look. Thanks very much to Mo and to Stu. Make sure to let us know in the comments below who you think your man of the match was and also if you think Liverpool need to change anything about their setup in advance of the second leg. Man United to come next, it's equally huge. Liverpool have got a Champions League on the line this season. They've also got a Premier League title on the line this season. Go to theanfieldwrap.com forward slash subscribe to get access to all the premium stuff that's behind the paywall. It's all fantastic. There'll be loads of pre-match build-up, loads of post-match as well. In the meantime, believe that Liverpool can go and do it. Look forward to the game. Hope you enjoy it. All the best.